Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Langle. Within the next couple years, I would like to start having children. Now maybe you're in this time of your life. Maybe you're not, maybe you have daughters or nieces or granddaughters who are thinking of having children. Or maybe that's not your life at all and the only interaction you have with babies is the infiltration of them on your Facebook feed as they're dressed in Halloween costumes and upcoming Christmas, uh, Christmas events and holiday costumes. So, of course, if I'm embarking on to this new experiment of bringing um, a new life into the world as a scientist, I like to implore my friends who have had children to ask them questions about their experiences, their problems, their issues. So we talk about different things, and one of the things they describe to me as being one of the most scary things is that keeps them up at night are the things that they cannot see that could infect their children. And these microorganisms are all around us. We're able to protect ourselves because of our robust immune responses. But these infants, unfortunately, are highly susceptible to infectious diseases. Now this year alone, 2.9 million infants will die. And of that, 20% will die because of things that we could likely prevent, like infectious diseases. So when I think about the contrasting view between bringing a new life into the world and this very stark reality that infants and babies will die is what our lab focuses on and what we think about on a day-to-day -day basis. So these infants are more susceptible than adults and older children. And because of modern medicine, we are able to keep babies and even premature infants alive longer and more successfully than we ever have in the past. But what that means is that we have populations of infants that we have to also protect from infectious diseases and develop prophylactic treatments and cures that we may not have had to think about in the past. So why are these children more susceptible to disease? They're more susceptible because their immune systems are immature. This might seem kind of obvious. They are new to the world. They haven't seen the things that we've seen in terms of the microorganisms we interact with. But this can manifest itself with different amounts of immune cells that are just lower in number. They're not able to secrete as many molecules or cytokines or proteins. But the one I specifically will bring up is a Y-shaped protein called an antibody. They circulate less in infants compared to older children. And that means that these infants are just not able to robustly respond to the environment around them. Now we know that for a couple reasons, this may be important because the infant has to develop a microbiome inside the gut and the lungs. So maybe it is for obvious reasons that it has to stay suppressed and stay immature so that it can slowly build up to be able to get to what an older children or an adult's immune system looks like. So what we've done in our modern medicine history is that if we have populations that are more susceptible to disease, we do things like develop vaccinations. So what this chart shows on the x-axis is the years from 1944 to 2004, and we see that the um, cases of measles in the United States have gone down after the introduction of a vaccine, and even, even uh, lower after the introduction of a second dose. So when we contrast these two different circumstances where we have populations of infants that are unprotected and we have this um, ability to develop vaccines for populations that are susceptible. We wonder then why within the first two months of life are we not able to give infants vaccines? And it is because of that immature immune system that we really cannot start vaccinating them until they're two months and able to robustly respond. So we are all here today. We've all survived infancy. Not a bunch of us are just dying off because of diseases. So if we're not able to vaccinate, then we must have a way to boost babies' immune systems. And we're able to do that through two different ways. So babies receive this Y-shaped protein antibody through two different ways, either transplacentally through cord blood or through breastfeeding through the mother's milk into the mammary gland and then if there, she's able to breastfeed to the infant. So in our lab, we are interested in studying the latter of the two. We're interested in studying the ways that we can boost a mother's immunity so that she can then convert that into her milk to provide her babies with enhanced protection, specifically within those first two months of life, which we know are a tough time for infants as they are coming in contact with diseases that they are not immune to. So what we do is we actually use pigs to study this human phenomenon.
Now, what's interesting about pigs is pigs cannot do the first thing that I described. They cannot transplacentally take their Y-shaped antibody and give it to the infant. They can't do that because their placenta is about six layers thick, so it's almost like it gets stuck. Whereas humans, there's only one layer and it can easily move. So in our lab, we like to think of the pig as a great way to look at enhancing immunity transfer through milk because they do this very efficiently and are able to provide piglets with their sole source of antibody needed to then go off into life and become older pigs. So we've heard to, um, throughout in biomedical history, mice and rodents are ways that we can model human disease. So why would we use pigs? So pigs have a lot of different similarities with humans which allow us to be able to study human phenomena within them. For one, physiology. You may have heard that heart valves are used for transplant patients in humans, and pigs are often thought about as an ideal species as we move forward to try to develop um, better organ transplant systems. Metabolism, nutrient sensing, gut barrier function, the amount and type of microbiota inside the gut, these are all things that are very similar interspecies between humans and pigs. Genetics. We all sit here today as very heterogeneous population. We are not an inbred population, at least I don't, not a lot of people are. So when we look at mice, they are actually inbred and we don't get to take advantage of the heterogeneity that we see within a human population. Pigs are similar to humans in that way. We do not have strains of inbred pigs, although you could develop them, but on the whole, we can take advantage of the heterogeneity found in that population. And lastly, in what our lab and what I am most interested in is the immunology. So the immune cells and how the immune system responds to viruses and bacteria and things in the environment. Pigs actually have all the different components and cell types that are found in humans and can respond similarly to um, the different pathogens. So this is why we use pigs to study. And what I started to do was I thought, okay, I'd like to boost the immune system of the mother so that I can boost the immune system of the babies. So I took three different groups of pregnant pigs. I took an agriculturally important virus, porcine epidemic diarrhea virus, which I will refer to as PEDV, and I gave it to in high doses to the first group of peg pregnant pigs. I then took a low dose of the same virus and gave it to the second group, and then to the third group, I didn't give anything, so essentially mock. So this virus is going to be ingested orally and it's going to start infecting the gut lining, the epithelial cells of the gut, and that mother is going to respond very robustly as she becomes infected. Um, and this immune response can manifest into the increase in a lot of different types of immune components, but specifically the one that I, we're interested in amongst others is that Y-shaped antibody that I talked about. So what we saw is that the guilt, the pregnant animal, was able to respond in the same capacity responded to the dose that we gave her. So the pigs that were given the high dose had a higher generation of antibody. The pigs that had the lower dose had a lower uh, decreased amount, but still higher than the mock. And we know that these antibodies are important because they are able to actually physically bind that virus up. And if that virus is bound by antibody, it's able to be easily excreted, and it's not going to bind to the epithelial lining and start replicating to cause more problems. So these pregnant animals, they're going to go on fine after about a week or so of some clinical signs. They go on fine to then have their babies, and they have this circulating antibody inside them as they are robustly responding. So after they give birth to piglets, the piglets are going to start suckling, and the antibody that's in the serum in the body of the mother is then, trans, um, then is transferred to the piglets in the milk. And so as that piglet ingests the milk, she's also ingesting the antibody as it enters into her stomach. So then the last question is, can I protect that piglet at the same dynamic that I see in the gilts and the amount of antibodies that they have? So what we do is we take piglets who've ingested the milk and ingested the antibody, and we infect them with the same virus. So after, look, after infecting them, this graph is depicting how many pigs survive dependent on if I gave their mother a lot of virus, a little, or nothing at all. So for the mothers who we gave a high dose of, a high dose of virus, all of their piglets 100% survive. For the ones that I gave an intermediate, about 63% of those piglets survive. And the ones that were born to mothers that I didn't give anything, 
over 90% die. So while there's a base level protection of about 10%, we still see that vaccinating them with a the live virus does increase their immunity to transfer to milk to transfer to them. So in our lab, obviously this is an agriculturally important virus, but what we're learning about not only is veterinary medicine, but potentially human health because of the reasons I described why pigs are very similar to humans immunologically, genetically, and physiologically. And so this concept of One Health and what we can learn from pigs and humans is things that I'm focused on in my PhD work. We know that humans and pigs alike respond differently to viruses depending on what trimester they see that virus. It can also depend on their nutrient status and whether they're deficient in a certain nutrient. So these are things that we think about as I move on um, with my program. And one of the things we think about in the lab as to why we need to kind of fill in this black hole that is maternal immunity is because on the left side, you could see the amount of vaccines that we currently have licensed and the amount of pathogens that could affect neonates on the right. So respiratory syncytial virus, cytomegalovirus, hepatitis virus, papillomavirus, these are all viruses that are more likely to affect infants in developing countries. But of course, the majority of infants in that 2.9 million who die every year are in developing countries and things like HIV that can be transferred through milk and diarrheal pathogens in less sanitary environments like rotavirus, E. coli, and verbio cholera are all things that we could target to enhance maternal immunity to transfer to the neonate. So why we care in this country, we often think about a developed country as being one that can prevent the deaths of infants. But unfortunately, there is a large disparity across the United States where not everyone, not every mother has access to maternal care. So what we think about in our lab as we're trudging through experiments and we're milking pigs and we're collecting rectal samples from piglets, is we like to think about the broader impacts of what enhancing maternal immunity could do. And so we see on this map here is the difference between across country. We want to try to enhance the ability of every mother um, to be able to boost her own immunity so that less infants die. And it can become even more dire when you look at the world view because in the center here when I depict it can be over 10% infant mortality and for every thousand infants that die. So not only are we targeting enhancing developed uh, maternal immunity in developed countries, but also in developing countries where the majority of them will die. So as I think about this One Health approach of veterinary medicine and enhancing maternal health, I do see myself and my friends um, and my friends' friends and the faces of this woman here as we work to try to develop enhanced prophylactic treatments for maternal immunity and infant immunity so that more people can enter society to fulfill whatever dreams that they may have. Thank you.